Well, we're hard at work. Uh, we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. You may remember a few months ago that the director of the NSF set up a panel to take a look at uh, what he should do about giant telescopes. And there was some speculation he might recommend zero or one or two. The panel did report. Uh, it was a very good group. Uh, they wrote a nice report that had a few quantitative errors, but other than that was, uh, you know, very thoughtful. And they did not recommend zero, one, or two. They didn't make a recommendation. They only did some findings, I would say, where they said, you know, both these projects, the GMT, Giant Magellan Telescope, and ours, the TM, are ready to be advanced to the final design phase. So that's kind of a formal thing within NSF. You're in preliminary design, and we have been. You have a preliminary design review, and we did. Uh, and then after some contemplation, the NSF could, if they wish, advance you to the final design phase. So we're hoping they'll do that soon. Um, I would say there's been a lot of activity in Washington that has occupied the NSF people with other matters, you know, in the, in the last few weeks. Nevertheless, uh, I think we're on course to uh, hear from them before too long. Mm. And of all the topics, you know, that TNT is capable of unraveling in the universe. They wrote up uh, 10 years ago a detailed science plan that said, here are the things we're going to do. And this is taken very seriously by the engineering crew. They said, well, if you want to do this, that, and the other, what does the telescope have to do? And so they wrote specifications for the telescope based on doing the science. Perhaps you're familiar with this concept. But that was 10 years ago, and it's fair enough to ask, how much has science changed in 10 years? Honestly, my special field, the field of uh, dark energy and cosmic expansion, hasn't changed very much. <laughs> but a field that has totally blossomed, of course, is exoplanets, the discovery of planets around other stars. So we wanted to make sure that even with the new understanding and the broader set of questions and kind of what we do know and don't know, that the telescope is still on the path to being powerful for that work. So we did that. And uh, that was a very healthy exercise. We got over 200 people to help fix this old report. You won't be too surprised to learn that we concluded that the telescope is going to be able to do these new things very, very well. But, but thinking farther down the line, this telescope is not for 10 years or, you know, it's for 50 years. And so it's a matter of getting the science for today and then the potential for science for tomorrow. Because if you think about it, the technology also is advancing. So it's not just the science, but the technology for detectors and everything is getting uh, better. And we are going to be in a position sooner or later uh, to have a second generation of instruments and to keep on making this telescope right up at the technological frontier. You know, if you think about uh, Palomar, we drove by yeah. Oceanside or wherever it was there, yeah. and I thought, gee, that's right downhill from, from Palomar. That telescope was built in 1950. You know, still it had led the world for quite a long time because the instruments kept getting better. They went from photographic plates to electronic detectors, all these things that we kind of know about and take for granted. And it isn't at the absolute forefront now, but it's still a very productive scientific uh, place. So I think the lesson from that is that these big telescopes at the frontier of what you can do today are going to last for decades and they're going to be it's a generational thing I, and i really feel that myself that um i got to use the 200 inch telescope i didn't build it i got to use the telescopes at Tololo in chile and uh at uh, kitt peak and i didn't build those but after a while you know you grow into a role where you do help to build the telescopes and i did help the magellan telescopes and i was the head of the uh, optical and infrared at the at the Center for Astrophysics for a while. So, um, and I was on the, actually, I'm kind of proud of this. I was on the, the committee that wrote the report. This is how we take pride in ourselves. I was on the committee that wrote the report about what we should do after the Hubble Space Telescope. And of course, that eventually became the James Webb Space Telescope. It's 3D print? Yeah, very nice work there. It's not that color, actually. <laughs> well, yeah, it's space and no one can see where it. Okay. 
So it was it wasn't that Hale who went a little bit over the edge uh, psychologically in the building of the hundred inch. Is, is that well, you? it was uh, in between the hundred inch and the two hundred inch. So it was very. Here's the interesting story. If I can remember the guy's name, I will tell you. But I haven't got it quite at the top of my uh, uh, mind. But there was at the the money for the two hundred inch telescope came from the Rockefeller Foundation. And the Rockefeller Foundation did not want to give the money to the Carnegie Institution, which had been running Mount Wilson, where uh, Hale had uh, been working. But Hale had another uh, uh, pocket there where he said, well, I also have this California Institute of Technology I've helped build. And so the money uh, came to, to Caltech for the, uh, for the 200 inch telescope. And the grants officer at the Rockefeller Foundation was a physicist uh, and participated quite a bit in the design and, you know, approval of the, uh, of the project. 